Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm very glad to be with you today because this is a special day for our association. For the first time we touch a subject very important and very delicate. In these two days of conference we will speak about racism and discrimination in sport. It's an important topic. A topic very sensitive because today we will speak about also the history of racism in the last 60, 50 years because if you remember there was a big protest in Mexico City 1968 during the Olympic, Tommy Jet Smith and after the situation that was in South Africa, very sensitive problem and it's important that we discuss about this subject because we have to develop a better knowledge about the fight against racism. We will have a lot of colleagues that we speak and experts that we speak about this. And I think that is very important that everybody of you listen very carefully because this is investment in culture, in knowledge that everybody of us has to follow because to, to create a better future we have to study what happened in the past to have a better idea for what we have to do in the future. I think that uh, this project and this seminar, it was a bit possible because it's part of a big program of our IPS Sport Media Awards. Because with the Qatari Association that is our partner in this award, we have put also a special program for culture and this event is part of it. I think that in these two days we will have a lot of occasion to be together and discuss together the main point and I hope that after we will have also to follow in the next month this subject because it's sure that we need to improve our knowledge to help the world to be better. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome our executive committee members also who are with us and now we will start with our one short film about racism nay till racism nay to racism no to racism no al racismo This was made by UEFA, and now I'm welcoming the first Vice President of UEFA, Mr. Carl Eric Nielsen. Mr. Nielsen, welcome. What have you said to us? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and the good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, of course, it's a real pleasure to be with you today, and I would like to personally thank the AIPS President, Gianni Merlo, for inviting us to this important conference and racism and, and, and discrimination in, in sport. Uh, let me start by stating that the fight to eliminate racism, discrimination and intolerance from football is a major priority for UEFA and its member associations. We strongly believe that the power of football can be used to tackle such issues as racism, homophobia, discrimination against ethnic minorities, and institutional discrimination, such as underrepresentation of women and lack of diversity. The campaign against discrimination, not just in um, around football, but in the European society as a whole, is a key belief of uh, UEFA's social responsibility program. You certainly all remember the, the film you just saw about our No to Racism campaign with a lot of famous players from all over the world saying no to racism. That's a strong message. The current campaign, Equal Game, is also about the right for everyone, no matter who you are, where you are from, how you play, and irrespectively of your skin color, gender, religion, to enjoy football without being the target of discrimination. To this end, UEFA has forged partnerships with many anti-discrimination organizations, led by the Football Against Racism in Europe, this network, FARE, 
and it is a core strate strategic partners already since 2001. We also have a partnership with the Homeless World Cup, a network of only 70 international partner organizations that use football as a tool to improve the lives of homeless people throughout the world. We have also been working hard on improving diversity at UEFA and we have recently appointed additional members, including women to our various committees. Here is more to do, of course, but we have now in our disciplinary bodies to ensure a more diverse composition and to better reflect today's society in decision-taking, a better and more diverse con uh, construction. As part of its zero tolerance policy against any form of racism and discrimination, UEFA has a match monitoring system in place whereby observers from the FARE network, which I just mentioned, attend matches and report any type of discriminatory behavior. This helped the independent UEFA control ethics and disciplinary board to open investigations and to impose sanction. I think that UEFA, UEFA has some of the toughest sanctions in sports in order to combat racism and other forms of discrimination. For instance, any player found guilty of racist behavior could be banned for a minimum of 10 matches. If a supporter of a club or a national team engage in racist behavior, this must be sanctioned and there can be partial or full stadium closure as well as financial penalty. In the last three seasons, the UEFA disciplinary bodies have imposed more than 70 partial stadium closures and ordered around 40 matches to be, be played behind closed doors. And we have also empowered uh, the referees with the option to stop the game as part of our three-step protocol in case of racist behavior. Referees should stop, suspend, and even abandon a match if the racist incidents occur. Following these three-step guidelines, the first thing is that the match will be stopped and a public warning will be given. Secondly, the match will be suspended for a period of time. Third, and after coordination with security officers and match delegates, the match will be abandoned if racist behavior has not ceased. In such a case, the responsible team forfeits their tie. All of this clearly shows that we are doing what is currently in our power to do, but it also shows what a serious problem we are facing and that we need to do more to show future generation that football, that must be synonymous with openness, tolerance and diversity. The problem is not on the pitch where I think the diversity is greater than in any other sport and probably in any other part of the society. The problem is in our societies as a whole. Uh, UEFA has for that reason also signed memorandums of understanding with the European Commission and the Council of Europe, which notably include the promotion and protection of fundamental human rights and the tackling of all forms of discrimination, both on and off the field. We are also working closely with the European authorities on a variety of projects, and I will outline just two of them. The first one is called FIRE, Football Including Refugees, and it aims at promoting inclusion, participation, socialization, and access to sport for asylum seekers, migrants, and refugees. More specifically, FIRE intends to enhance the fostering of intercultural openness in football clubs by empowering and supporting them to work with the specified target groups. Because sport enable us to bring people together regardless of nationality, citizenship, cultural background, legal status, or any other variables of this lack. The UEFA Foundation for Children together with the European Commission are also working on a project called UNITY which is about ways to facilitate the inclusion of migrants into society through football festivals. In celebration of the 60th anniversary of the UEFA European Club uh, Football Championships, the Euro 2020, which will be held actually next year, there will be held in 12 different cities, this will be held in 12 different cities across our uh, European uh, continent. 
This unique multicultural country structure provides a platform to showcase the potential of football uh, inclusion comes uh, from a third country nations, uh, nationals to, to European uh, public through awareness racing festivals in many of the UEFA Euro 2020 host cities. We are really looking forward to, to this next year. Third country nationals and European young people will, during these festivals, exchange in a series of forums and a football for inclusion tournaments that will demonstrate football's unique position to promote, to promote equality and social inclusion as strong European values. This clearly shows that we need governments to work with us because education is of course a key to combating racism. Uh, the UEFA statutes, uh, statutes provide the key, that a key objective is to promote football around Europe in a spirit of peace, understanding, fair play, and without discrimination of any kind. Respect is there for a key principle of the game, and racism and other forms of discrimination must be kicked out from any sport once and for all. And we also require clubs and our 55 national associations to run awareness programs to tackle racism. Furthermore, disciplinary sanction for any racist behavior should be accompanied by such awareness program, which anti-racism organization could helpfully assist us with. Education will help to address the problem, both in football and in wider society. No doubt European football is united against racism. And I'm very pleased to have the, uh, the possibility to address this to you today, because we can, and also together with you in media, we can definitely play a big part in putting a stop to racism. And I think we need to do it now, not tomorrow, not next week, but now. So I wish all of you participating today a fruitful conference together. And thank you very much for giving me the floor and the opportunity to address this to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Uh, we have some uh, maybe technical problems, but uh, anyway, thank you very much. We hear you very clearly. And I hear these uh, words about the uh, kick of racism and discrimination from all the sports all over the world. Very nice words. But you have mentioned referees. And uh, Mr. Nicola Rizzoli, international former football uh, referee and FIFA listed referee, is with us also. Mr. Rizzoli, please let us hear you. Hello to everybody and thank you very much for this uh, uh, invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you all uh, and to share with you my experience uh, because uh, it is, it's difficult to speak uh, after uh, Mr. Nielsen. Uh, which give you uh, a very complete uh, uh, situation uh, on uh, what is uh, one of the huge problem uh, of ever and since ever, because uh, uh, since uh, I was international, it means uh, 2007, uh, I heard about uh, what we can do to fight uh, this huge problem. And uh, certainly uh, the sport can do something and football especially has to do something, has to act uh, to fight this kind of uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, what can I certainly do is testify that uh, UEFA and FIFA as well are uh, really strongly acting against this uh, youth problem. And uh, for sure, uh, if you read the, the laws of the game, speaking about football, for sure, for, of course, uh, the laws number five uh, is speaking about uh, this behavior. So it means that uh, they really do something uh, serious, uh, giving the referee the power to, uh, as uh, Mr. Nelson told you, to stop, to suspend, uh, to abandon the match. This is written in the laws of the game. It means that uh, uh, it's really something that they, they want to fight. Um, and the referee has to act to fight this uh, serious problem. Uh, I would say uh, the, that the racism in football can be not only uh, about the colors uh, of uh, the skill, but uh, 
uh, also of uh, uh, discriminatory regional situation or uh, uh, any kind of forms uh, uh, that we have to act against. So after this kind of step that I would like to underline, uh, because it's very, it's very important that they are made properly, uh, the referee, once uh, he personally hears something against uh, uh, a player or uh, a group of uh, region of people, uh, has to stop immediately the, the game and to make an announcement that this kind of behavior can't be uh, acceptable. Uh, after a first step, uh, he can uh, restart the game if uh, the situation uh, permits it. And uh, if, uh, unfortunately, after uh, a communication message in the stadium, this kind of behavior continue, uh, he have to stop the game, abandon the, the, the match. It means that uh, all the players have to return in their dressing room. And this is uh, really uh, something that also from image is, uh, is something that, which is very strong. And we have to be strong against this kind of uh, uh, behavior. And then if uh, it's possible, we will uh, return on the pitch and we will restart the game till the next uh, uh, we hope uh, it never happen uh, anymore. Uh, but if there is uh, the third uh, necessary step uh, is to uh, abandon definitely the match, uh, which is uh, the worst uh, things uh, can happen on football. But uh, um, what is very important uh, to underline, uh, and I bring some videos uh, that uh, we can uh, uh, show, show in uh, some minutes, uh, what we want to underline uh, now, as probably mo most of you know, I am the former of the Italian referee. Um, what we, we are telling to our referees is that uh, we have to fight together. Uh, we, don't, uh, we can't uh, fight uh, alone because uh, if we are together, we are really much more stronger. And uh, this matter has to, uh, uh, to be a part also the players. They have to understand that uh, together we are definitely uh, more stronger and we can fight uh, something more. So if we can uh, uh, start uh, the first video, uh, then we will discuss uh, just a minute of no need, if it's possible. Injured. Natelli, he produced some magic. Oh. Balotelli immediately kicks the ball into the crowd. He's injured. Balotelli, he produced some magic. Oh. Balotelli immediately kicks the ball into the crowd. Did he feel there was something enchanted towards him? Why would he do that? Mario Balotelli. He's going to leave the pitch. Oh, goodness me, this is incredible. The referee has to take control of this situation. Both sets of players are coming up to Mario. So as, uh, as you are uh, looking at uh, uh, Mario Balotelli, uh, heard something uh, for sure, which is Mario bad words against uh, uh, the color of uh, his skin. And he reacts alone, he reacts alone, uh, which is, uh, uh, I would say, a very instinctive way uh, to, to deal with the, this uh, huge problem. But at the end of the day, uh, as you saw, the referee tried to, to go to him and to speak, because uh, at the first moment, nobody understood what was going on. And uh, for sure, we're asking uh, to the player to don't do this kind of uh, uh, reaction alone, because probably... He, he feel alone, but uh, you are never alone it's on the pitch. Uh, uh, as you are looking at now, all the people, all the players are surrounding and uh, try to convince uh, Balotelli that uh, we are fighting all together. And also the referees uh, start his kind of procedures as uh, uh, you saw, um, stopping the match. And in this moment, uh, asking to the player to collaborate uh, and to try to all together do something uh, and the first step of course the announcement 
Uh, if we see, if we, we can watch the second video, uh, this is the behavior uh, that after uh, this situation well, he was happened, where the player do really something uh, all together against uh, this uh, huge problem. And this is much more helpful uh, to everybody because you see here that the referees stopped the match uh, because there were uh, uh, discriminatory for regional reason uh, problem. And you know, when you play uh, south against uh, the north uh, of Italy can be, can be a problem. The referee asked uh, uh, for uh, the announcement and stop uh, uh, the match. And immediately the captain of the uh, Roma team go toward the supporter speaking and all together try to uh, to solve this uh, this problem this is really the behavior as you're looking at of the player that we need because we need to do all together something and uh, you know convulsing uh, uh, thousands of people together in the same moment is uh, it's something that uh, is very powerful and to fight, uh, as we mentioned, uh, this huge problem, uh, we have to be together because together we are much more stronger. So thank you very much for this kind of opportunity just to, to show how uh, can be deal from the referee side because uh, we are happy that uh, uh, FIFA and UEFA give us uh, this, uh, uh, this power to stop the match, do something which is in the protocol and as you see, the, the reaction of the player now is really the, the behavior that we need to fight all together. So I wish you really a fantastic afternoon. And uh, we are here to support any, any discussion. Thank you very much. Very much, uh, Mr. Rizzoli. It was very, very good. I agree with you absolutely that uh, football is number one, is fighting against racism and uh, discrimination. But not only football players not only uh, referees but also the football journalists so the next one who will speak about racism is my colleague mark gleason who is uh, from south africa he's football journalist and commentator also a member of our aips uh, awards uh, jury mark welcome and we are listening to you thank you very much uh, general secretary and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, it looks like you cannot hear me. You have a puzzled look on your face. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay. Big thumbs up. <laughs> um, hello to everyone. I'm talking to you from uh, the world's most beautiful city, Cape Town. And um, nice to see so many uh, good friends as well on the uh, list of people who are, are here today. I want to, um, I've, I've been asked really to explain the institutionalized system of racism called apartheid, which of course blighted the history of my country for uh, tens of year, tens of hundreds of years, and I've only got seven minutes in which to do so, uh, which is a, a really tough task. But I do hope that I will be able to give you uh, a fairly brief history. Uh, many of you will, of course, know the story of South Africa, but many of you of a, perhaps of a newer generation are not aware. So I'm going to. Um, I, I hope I can take over the control of this. Uh, presentation do you uh, i cannot see it myself but do you now see a slide that says racism somebody say yes again okay so we can proceed from here that's a definition of racism we won't uh, make this a long academic uh, um, discussion what was apartheid apartheid was of course the policy in south africa which uh, divided society on uh, the grounds of the color of your skin uh, white colonialism had taken territory, had established colonies, and uh, not dissimilar to the stories of America and Australia, um, New Zealand, Canada, etc. But perhaps different from the rest of Africa, you had large-scale um, white migration to the south of Africa, to southern Africa, and later on then a system where uh, the whites who were very much in the minority held the power uh, and it was to the detriment of people of color and as you can see in those in in the days of the uh, 60s 70s 50s 40s society was completely separate to even to the ridiculous extent of this picture that you can see where they had two different entry points to the railway station 
on the left hand side for black people and for the on the right hand side for white people. This was uh, called petty apartheid and it was in all forms of society, be it benches in the park, be it queues in the post office. Um, everything was on a separate basis and all based on the color of your skin. Can you see the railway? That's the entrance to the railway station in the days of apartheid on the left hand side black people on the right hand side white people and as I said it, that that is how uh, petty apartheid was in those days it uh, was in all forms of society be it uh, the park benches be it the entrance to uh, uh, the post office every single possible uh, uh, part of society was separated blacks on the one side whites on the other side um, the race policy really uh, took effect in 1948 uh, with the with the change of government, and and it was then legislated. Uh, only white people who made up 10% of the population were able to vote and able to serve in government. Uh, other race groups were all second class citizens. It, uh, the best jobs were kept for whites. The best education was for white people. Um, the best areas were for white people, black people had to live in separate areas. And uh, right until the 1970s, if you were a black man and you wanted to move around, you had to have uh, a document called a passbook. This was a hated document. Uh, police would stop black people uh, and ask them where they were going and did they have their passbook. And if they did not have the passbook, they were invariably arrested and jailed. Uh, there was very little opportunity for uh, black people to advance themselves. Um, they couldn't own property, there were very few businesses, black owned businesses, and uh, even less people had a chance to get an education to move ahead in life. So it really was a horrible, uh, a horrible, horrible stigma. And um, it of course, the rest of the world um, stood up slowly over the decades and um, isolated South Africa and uh, forced it eventually to change its ways. And in 1994, we had the first election where everybody could vote. And Nelson Mandela became the first democratically elected president of uh, South Africa. So how did we get to an end apartheid? And this is basically where we come into it with sport. Um, first of all, it took a very long time. It was an armed struggle. It wasn't uh, particularly effective. The, the white uh, government had a very strong military uh, slowly over the years, international sanctions, oil sanctions, uh, flight sanctions, later on more severe economic sanctions began to strangle the white government and uh, economically they felt the pinch. This was one of the major reasons that forced them to the negotiating table. And then the sports boycott uh, played a very big part as well in changing, first of all, in highlighting uh, what was happening in South Africa and then, of course, changing the system over time. The sports boycott uh, basically meant that South Africa was effectively kicked out of all of the uh, international competitions, uh, some a little bit slower than others. Uh, football uh, was a, one of the early fighters against uh, apartheid and against the South African system, although South Africa was only suspended by FIFA in 1964 and eventually only kicked out in 1974 when Joao Havelange came to power. He used it as... Uh, a vote gathering uh, 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 ploy in his in his uh, successful bid to become the president. The Olympic movement kicked South Africa out of the Olympics in 1960 uh, from the 1964 games onwards, and they only returned in 1992. Uh, slowly over time, South Africa was prohibited from participating in more and more international competition. But we still saw a lot of cricket and rugby tours, uh, in particular. Uh, these began to be curtailed in the, in the 1970s, particularly after pressure from the African countries uh, in the Commonwealth who forced countries like Australia and New Zealand not to allow their sporting teams to come to South Africa. This was a big blow also to the white psyche in, uh, in South Africa because sport uh, was, is very popular amongst all population groups. But um, as long as white South Africans felt that they were part of uh, some international brotherhood in sport, they felt that they could keep their system going. And as the sports boycott began to uh, strangle, so they began to realize that apartheid was not the system uh, of the, uh, that uh, was not a system that uh, they could keep going. Uh, the other 
very effective uh, part of the sports boycott was international sports people who came to compete in South Africa in, let's say, a golf tournament or a tennis tournament faced uh, sanctions uh, once they returned to their native country. And uh, after a while, we saw less and less people coming to participate in, uh, in South Africa. Then, uh, of course, this meant we've had in our history uh, a generation who uh, grew up in isolation. Um, apartheid and the world's abhorrence thereof meant uh, South African sport was isolated. And very talented sports people, black and white, missed out on an opportunity for international competition because of the system that the government had imposed on the country. This is a picture, by the way, of the first South African mixed soccer team in 1977. It was the first time that black and white players played together in the same national team. But it was only uh, in 1992, which is uh, 15 years later, that South Africa eventually got a chance to play in uh, international football and actually have a genuine national team. Um, so growing up, of course, in, in that era meant that uh, you never had a national team to support. You had no heroes to cheer at the Olympics. You were a pariah of the world. And um, when South Africa was eventually readmitted into world sport and allowed to compete on, uh, with, with the rest of the world. It felt like a rebirth for, uh, for all South Africans. Um, the final page I want to show you is um, the policy that Nelson Mandela um, pressed quite uh, uh, strongly when he came into power was using sport as a way to bind this new nation together, to create a new and non-racial South Africa. And uh, it has, while it's no panacea, one must admit that uh, sport, uh, while it does provide a, a feel good feeling and it does make people um, come together at times, it's no panacea for uh, the great divide that we have in this country in terms of wealth, the great disparity between the rich and the poor, um, the lack of economic opportunity that is still um, the case in, in South Africa. But we do have uh, many more positive moments, none better so than that picture over there, which is from last November in Tokyo, South Africa, winning the uh, Rugby World Cup. And that team, as you can see, uh, a wonderful mix uh, of all South Africans and a wonderful uh, vision of the potential of this country uh, now that the um, now that the uh, tragedy of apartheid is long in the distant past. It is now almost uh, 20 years or just, uh, just under 20 years uh, of, of uh, normality. We are well aware of our um, bitter history, but uh, we are positive that uh, we can move forward. So hopefully that's an explanation for those of you who are perhaps uh, of a younger generation and a reminder to uh, most of you listening of uh, what things were like in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 1980s. Thank you, Mark. This was, this was a kind of a lecture, like you are a professor and you are talking about situation in your country. So in this moment, uh, while I'm speaking about lecturers and professors, we are moving to United States. Professor Ron Thomas from uh, Morehouse College is with us. Professor, welcome. Hi, welcome. Thank, thanks very much for, uh, for inviting me. It's um, my first time I participated in an AIPS event, and um, I found it very interesting already uh, to the last uh, presentation. And uh, so I'm really glad to be here. I've been able to uh, talk about how black sports reporters uh, in America approach uh, doing their jobs and also um, talking, you know, writing about and talking about uh, situations regarding race. And I thought the best way to do it would be to do it from sort of a historical standpoint in terms of talking about, um, you know, how black uh, sports reporters have done that dating back almost 100 years and, and working up toward uh, toward today. So could the, um, could the host just give me a thumbs up? Just let me know that you can hear me okay. Um, 
Mr. Merlo, can you hear me fine? Okay. It is okay. It is okay. It is okay. okay. So, um, I'll continue. I've prepared um, a, about a seven minute talk um, about this history of black sports reporters and how we've approached doing our job. And hopefully there are some photos I sent and hopefully those will be shown while I, um, while I give the talk. All right, I'll begin. The black sports writer has always been more than a job title. Along with describing exciting plays, interviewing athletes and coaches and explaining team strategic and financial calculations, we have been activist journalists who felt obligated to uphold and protect our race. That was true in the early 20th century when Wendell Smith, Sam Lacey, Chester Washington, A.S. Doc Young, Joe Bostic and others covered sports for black owned newspapers. The desire to write about race and sports was a major reason I became a sports reporter. And for 34 years, the racial dynamics of sports were my specialty. They also are a top priority for today's black sports journalists, and that will be true in the future, certainly for those who are trained in the Morehouse College journalism and sports program that I direct. While recording the exploits of male and, and female athletes, black sports journalists have pursued two unwritten tasks. One, to employ white decision makers, to hire more black sports figures as players, coaches, administrators, and owners, and two, to defend them against the racism, insensitivity, and extra scrutiny they often encounter. Sam Lacey, who you see depicted on the screen now, was an African-American and Native American sports journalist whose career- Professor, spent... can you be a little bit slower because of the translation? Uh, Sorry for that. A little bit well, slower. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sam Lacey was an African-American and Native American sports journalist whose career spanned an unbelievable 77 years, from 1926 until 2003. When he died at 99, he still was writing a weekly column for the Baltimore Afro-American Afro newspaper. Once I was in the writing business, fighting against racial discrimination through my sports pages and columns came naturally, Lacey said in his autobiography, Fighting for Fairness there wouldn't be any of that nonsense about keeping politics out of sports. Early in his career, his peers lobbied for the integration, integration of or more diversity in all sports. Bringing black players into baseball's all white pastime, Major League Baseball was their top priority. Why not give baseball a little color, Lacey wrote in 1935. But black sports journalists did more than just ask, they also acted. Lacey once spent almost three feudal hours trying to convince Washington Senator's owner, Clark Griffith, to integrate his team. Wendell Smith arranged tryouts for black players with three major league teams that rejected them. In 1945, Lacey even joined team owners on a committee to explore integrating that sport. Smith eventually recommended Jackie Robinson to the Brooklyn Dodgers and he desegregated the majors in 1947. The next year, Smith, who wrote for the Pittsburgh Courier, became the first black sports writer to make the leap from the black press to a white owned newspaper, the Chicago Herald American. He was a reporter, columnist and television sportscaster in Chicago for the next 25 years. So here you see Smith with Jackie Robinson and here you, and next you see Smith um, when he was working for the Chicago Herald American. Meanwhile, black journalists continued to lobby for opportunities for sports figures and for ourselves. In the 1950s and 60s, NFL teams seldom scouted, fo scouted football players at black colleges, but Pittsburgh Courier sports editor, Bill Nunn Jr. covered their games and printed the black college All-America team from 1950 to 1974. NFL teams often used it as a scouting report on draft days. Eventual Hall of Famers, Art Shell, John Stallworth, Donnie Shell, and Roosevelt Brown Jr. depicted here, all were on Nunn's teams. Meanwhile, a trickle of black sports journalists were being hired by print and broadcast media. 
I became part of that trickle in 1973 when the Rochester Times Union hired me to cover high school sports. While there, Black Sports Magazine ran a feature story about young black sports reporter David Dupree, the Washington Post NFL beat reporter. Just reading that article assured me that I could cover the pros someday. I spent two years apiece in Rochester and Chicago, then was hired by the San Francisco Chronicle in 1978. Sometime in the early 1980s, when I was covering the NBA, I received a list from the Boston Globe's Larry Whiteside, whom I did not know. And here you see me underneath uh, Julius Irving's arm here as I cover the Celtics uh, 76ers game. Um, the list I received from the Boston Globe's Larry Whiteside uh, was entitled The Black Sports Writers and its 24 names, all print reporters took up only half a sheet of paper. Larry was number one, I was number 17. Starting in 1971, as Larry traveled around the country, every time he met or heard about a black sports writer he did not know, Larry added him to, for, to what became known as the blacklist. Regrettably, there were no women among us at that time. The list was the unofficial count of black sports journalists until November 25th, 1987, when the Sports Task Force of the National Association of Black Journalists was formed by 42 print and broadcast journalists. I became its first chair and our annual Pioneers, Pioneer Awards are named after Sam Lacey. Now the task force has about 400 members, including nationally known journalists such as Michael Wilbon, Jamel Hill, Bill Roden, who is shown here, and Mark Spears. And there are more black sports journalists who are not members. But outside of ESPN, among us, there are too few sports editors, indeed less than 10 in the whole nation, and too few columnists, the most influential people in our business. Black sports reporters have achieved much in the last 100 years. Indeed, Lacey, Smith, Whiteside, and Claire Smith are in the writer's wing of the Baseball Hall of Fame. But in some ways, our work has remained the same as our predecessors in the 1930s. We still push for opportunity for Black people at all levels of sports. We still protect activist Black athletes from Muhammad Ali and Tina Williams and Colin Kaepernick. Yes, we tried, to get, we tried our best to get white America and our white peers in the journalism business to accept that his kneeling in the national anthem had nothing to do with the flag and everything to do with the unmerited killing of black people by police. But skeptics, skeptics didn't believe us until they saw George Floyd suffocate for eight minutes and 46 seconds on May 25th, 2020. Our job will never be finished because black sports journalists don't get timeouts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Thomas. It was a very, very good story and thank you for this. I remind all our uh, visitors on our Zoom that you can uh, start to send your questions if you have one only on our email, president's office at uh, aibsmedia.com. So only, only uh, email questions will be read to, to today here in uh, and you see the address. We will stay in the United States. Next is uh, our good friend, Donna Devarona, former Olympic champion and the lady who works with television a long, long time of years. But not only that, she is also an activist for women rights and everything involved in human rights. So Donna, your seven minutes. Okay, um, it's an honor to follow um, the pre presentations that have just been um, given. What I did notice is the absence of a lot of focus on women and discrimination. So I guess that's my job. Uh, I did enjoy the uh, UEFA football message. I would have liked to have seen women included in that video because if you can't see it, you don't embrace it. Uh, women are role models and we fought a long battle to be included both 
as uh, women of color and uh, white women to take our place, rightful place, I think, in the sports landscape. Whereas participation in sport is broadly considered a right, a human right, competing on elite level is not a right, but a privilege. Highly competitive sport in and of itself discriminates on the basis of opportunity given, talent, and gender. However, one, of the, one must acknowledge there have been, as we've heard, tremendous barriers to entry on all levels of sport on racism, especially based on racism and discrimination. For the purposes of this session, I will address how sport, especially for me, and how international sport has helped up and open up those barriers. During my very first Olympics, believe it or not, the 1960 Rome Games, women comprised less than 10% of the competitors. Currently in the Olympic Games, at least on the field of play, women have almost reached parity. These changes have come about because of the following, progressive leadership, athletes and women's voices, growth in the popularity of international sport, sponsor interests, debate, and big business interests. For certain in the 1960s, in my specialty, competitive swimming, I do not recall one person of color winning a medal, much less representing any country in that sport. Not until the 2016 Rio Olympics did an African-American woman capture an individual gold in swimming. In the United States, the US Swimming uh, Federation decided to focus on minorities' participation. Additionally, in 1960, no team sports were offered to women. There were limited opportunities to coach, officiate, or serve as administrators. Indeed, in these categories, women are still underrepresented. It would take well into the 1980s before women served on the International Olympic Committee or on individual National Olympic Committees and various sports federations. Women were not allowed to compete in long distances in any sport back then. The marathon made its debut, debut during the 1984 Los Angeles Games. The first team sport volleyball took place during the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Women's basketball made its first appearance more than a decade later. Donna, during... please, a little bit slower because of the translation. A little bit slower, please. Sorry, sorry. During the 1976 Montreal Olympics. As for the world's most popular international sport, football, it made its first entry into the Olympics during the 1996 Atlanta Games, after making its first appearance as a World Cup tournament in 1991 in China. On a professional level, few women enjoy lucrative careers in individual sports, with the exception of tennis, golf, skiing, and ice skating. In respect to team sports, only after the unprecedented successes of the 1999 US hosted FIFA World Cup, the 2015 Canadian and then the 2019 French World Cup has the FIFA leadership begun to recognize the potential of the women's game to not only attract players and fans, but to produce unprecedented revenue and growth. Many factors have led have come to play in order to transform the fields of play, including cultural barriers, prejudice, and lack of resources. So what did I learn as a 13-year-old Olympian that I would never have understood or experienced without taking part in the international world of sport, especially in the Olympics? I experienced firsthand the international language of sport, which is no matter what country, heritage or language one speaks, we all share the same feelings, aspirations, and dreams. We all want to belong, to realize our potential, to be part of something special. The Olympic Village gave me a safe place and a place to be entirely human, to take part in what is a global experiment. During the early 1960s in the United States, the civil rights movement was just beginning to bubble to the service. In many places, black then, if a black man touched a white woman, he risked his life. Yet during the opening ceremonies of the Rome games, it was Team USA starting center, basketball great African-American Walt Bellamy, who without a bit of hesitation, lifted me high onto his shoulders so I could at five feet, two inches, watch the final torch runner light the Olympic fame. The games had created a unifying space for both of us. 
Years later, Walt and I would work in New York to help raise funds for boys and girls clubs. It was also during the Rome Olympics I met the soon to become professional heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Muhammad Ali, and track and field sprinter, three-time gold medalist, Wilma Rudolph. We became lifetime friends and worked together on various legislative initiatives, including Title IX, which gave women entry into medical school and all areas of endeavor, as well as sports scholarships. We also worked on the Amateur Sports Act to restructure our Olympic Committee. Wilma created her own foundation to mentor youth. And of course, Muhammad Ali went on and sacrificed everything, including his professional boxing career, to call out injustice whenever he saw them. These sports connections enhanced my life and gave me a deep understanding of how we as women have had to struggle against discrimination. How not only my African-American friends, but many others have suffered from systematic racism. The open conversation I was able to share with the USA track team, as well as athletes from other countries, helped me recognize in a much deeper way what both racism and discrimination looks and feels like. Since my first Olympic games in 1960, sports competition have expanded worldwide to be much more inclusive. We're much more aware of these issues. On every level, athletes have emerged as leaders and agents for change. They have experienced firsthand respect for their own teammates and even rivals. They have shared the common knowledge of international sport. I can't help but thinking as athletes take the knee that the international sport experience has helped nurture this diverse expression of protest. Thank you for the time. Well, I, yes, thank you, thank you again. Uh, I just have to say that UEFA do have some videos also with women, but we just show one of them. So, uh, but tomorrow we will talk more about that discrimination and thank you for your note in any case. Next is uh, Christine Brenner. Our colleague, sport columnist from USA Today, Christine, were, was already with us several times. So, Christine, just welcome. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. You can hear me okay? Yes. Yes, it's okay. Thank you. Well, what an honor to follow my friends Ron and Donna, uh, and of course, all of you, uh, just Ron and Donna being fellow countrymen and women, but uh, um, to all of you, thank you. And uh, just a delight to see so many familiar faces. And, to Johnny and everyone there, um, it's just a delight and an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for putting this on and having these conversations. And may I just say one more thing about Donna DeVarona. Uh, Donna, you paved the way for me and talk about exactly illustrating what you have just discussed. If there's no Donna DeVarona, there's no Christine Brennan. Donna DeVarona, your path uh, in not only in sports, but in television and sports media, uh, gave me the chance, and I thank you every single day, as you know, my dear friend. So uh, again, thank you for being the wonderful person you are. I wanted to touch on both racism and uh, sexism or discrimination. I will not be able to be with you tomorrow, so I wanted to touch on both of these things. Uh, again, so many have uh, have told so so many important stories already, but I thought I would share two stories about uh, on the issue of racism and uh, positive uh, outcomes, or at least outcomes that we can be, uh, be positive about, that we can look to and say, things are getting a little bit better. Uh, the story of Colin Kaepernick, Ron mentioned Colin Kaepernick, of course, the American football star, who in August of 2016 decided to take a knee during the national anthem in a preseason game and that was done in peaceful protest of social injustice and police brutality. And yet, unfortunately, people from President Trump on down made that about the flag and about patriotism. When in fact, of course, Colin Kaepernick was receiving advice from a Green Beret, the best of American service people about how to protest. So of course that was egregious, that was horrible how that uh, how his peaceful protest was taken and, and used as a weapon against not only him, but so many others, uh, black and white, uh, men and women who wanted to protest these important issues. And I'd like to then contrast that visual of Colin Kaepernick on a knee, which Ron showed you, 
uh, with the image of George Floyd being killed by a police officer who put his knee on George Floyd's neck in May of 2020. Those two images side by side, I think tell the story of how American sports have been shaped by racism since George Floyd's death, which of course was only four months ago. But Kaepernick was right. Let's make no mistake about it. Colin Kaepernick was completely right. He started a national conversation that was so important in the United States and around the world. And yet half of our nation did not want to participate in that conversation. What a tragedy, what a tragedy that is. And it was, and still is. Uh, the good news, because I said this would be positive or at least try to be positive, is that the NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell, uh, has finally admitted uh, that he should have listened to Colin Kaepernick sooner and learned about what his peaceful protest was all about. That's progress. It's too late, but it is progress. And now, of course, as I'm sure all of you are aware to some degree, obviously those of us in the States are very aware of this, the National Football League, the NBA, the WNBA, and other leagues, Women's Soccer League, Men's Soccer League, Pro Soccer Leagues in our country are all raising their voices in support of Black Lives Matter and the victims of police brutality. All the t-shirts, all the kneeling, all the arms raised, this is going to continue in our country and hopefully around the world. American sports are leading that conversation and journalists of course are in the forefront of reporting that conversation and giving their opinions in columns about that conversation. And I've been honored to do that in many columns uh, during uh, the pandemic, which of course this has all happened while uh, that has been going on as well. Another positive outcome, the Washington football team, once called, and I even hate to say the term, but I'm gonna say it for those of you who may not know, uh, the word is the Redskins. And again, a terrible, terrible name. I, uh, it's a racist name, it was a name that was there for generations. I covered the Washington football team for three years for the Washington Post in the mid to late 1980s. And uh, I said that name a lot in those years. I didn't give it a second thought, no one did. But then the issue started to come up in around 2013 and I wrote a column for USA Today and I said that I can't use that name anymore. And a few other journalists were doing the same thing. I was certainly not alone, uh, but because I'd covered the team and I'm in Washington DC, that it got a lot of attention. That was seven years ago. Uh, when I said, I just cannot say the name anymore. And we all tried to find funny way. I'm sure all of you know, once you have something that's so natural to say, it's so hard not to say it. But we find you know, Washington NFL team, the Washington Washingtons. Uh, we actually kind of all made fun of ourselves in a fun way, um, not making humor. It's not a humorous situation, but making fun of ourselves about what we would say because we did not want to say the R word. We did not want to stumble into that. And this was going on uh, in small pockets around, around the country and certainly in Washington, DC, but by far the popular opinion was keep the name, tradition, keep the name. And in fact, the team's owner, Dan Snyder said he would never change the team name. Never, he said to my colleague, Eric Brady at USA Today, never, all caps, never. Then came the George Floyd protests and uh, the summer, of course, and the Black Lives Matter social media movement and protest. And interestingly, folks, what happened was the Washington team, still named the R word, decided to put a Black Lives Matter, uh, the black screen of the Black Lives Matter that day on social media. And everyone called out the hypocrisy. How dare you of all teams put that black box, that black screen on your social media when your name itself, the very essence of your team is racism. And that did it. Sponsors started to say, big money sponsors, FedEx and, and others, Nike said, we cannot support this name anymore. And when money, of course, big money starts talking, people listen. And very, very quickly, the dominoes started to fall. And within a few days back in July, uh, middle of July, 
the name of the Washington NFL team was gone forever. It happened like that, even though of course it had been a conversation for seven years, but when it happened, it happened so quickly. And uh, it was a quick and stunning turn and it was the right one. And it was again led in many ways by the media and then the corporate dollars that got everyone's attention. So things can happen. I also wanna to touch briefly on sexism. I know that is the subject for tomorrow, but I will say this, that in every video you do, as Donna mentioned, and I understand, of course, that's for tomorrow, uh, in every conversation you have, please, and I know mostly men are on this uh, call, uh, as journalists or as leaders of sports organizations, um, say to yourself, before that story is written, before that video is sent, have we included people of color? Have we included women? There's, there really should be a checklist in your head. It's not about tokenism. It's not about uh, making sure, oh, we've got our one this or one that. No, it's about doing the right thing and growing your game, growing your sport. Obviously women and girls are the growth industry of every single one of our sports. If this is business, you want to reach the growth industry and it is business. You want to reach the underrepresented gender or the underrepresented nationality or the underrepresented um, race, whatever it might be, uh, you have to do better. We all have to do better. And as journalists, we have to think about everyone, not just the white person in suburban America, which is what we've done for generations. And just a quick little thought for you. You're gonna say she's gone crazy, and maybe I have. Let's consider your national men's football team. You call them the national team, right? There's no adjective men's. You just call them the national team. That's, that's your national team, right? Now consider you how you refer to your women's football team. Well, you don't call them the national team, right? No, you call them the women's national team. This might sound unimportant, but it's not. Here in the United States, we don't do a lot of things right. We do something great. We don't do a lot of things great. Obviously, I'm the first to admit it, and I'll point those things out all the time, um, but we try. And here in the US, the US Soccer Federation calls its men's team, the US men's national team. I think sometimes people laugh around the world that the US adds that adjective men's. Uh, but we mostly in journalists here in the United States do use the word men's and women's. And why do we do that? We do it out of respect for the fact that we have two national teams, not one. Also, we do it for our readers and our viewers to make it clear which team we're talking about, especially in the United States, one team wins all the time, the other one doesn't. Um, but if you don't use the adjective men's for your men's football team or your national basketball team, why don't you? I challenge you, journalist to journalist, if your answer is that it's tradition, that's not good enough. Not now, it's 2020. It's time to make it crystal clear and show that the women, show the women the respect they deserve. They are not the second team. They're not forgotten. They don't matter. No, no, they do matter. And if I may ask just that one simple thing, just to start the conversation, every time you write or talk about the national team for soccer, whatever, to add the word men's out of respect for women. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. This is a very interesting idea. Let us think about it and let you know what do we think about it. But uh, anyway, thank you very much for your uh, kind, of, kind of introduction of tomorrow's team, which will be discrimination. But now we are going back to our today's team, which is racism. And our next uh, panelist is Mr. Carlos Pons from Mexico. He's editor-in-chief in the newspaper's record. Carlos, your time. Thank you. Thank you and hello to everybody. I, I will speak in Spanish because um, the matter that uh, I will talk to you, it's a specific word in Spanish that it's uh, taken like, uh, like a party, like uh, some folklore, but it's, uh, it has a discriminatory connotation in the bottom. No, in the origin of this word. So I hope, uh, I trust we have a good translation. Um, en mi país, en los últimos 30 años, empezó una especie de ritual, de fiesta, 
en la tribuna de los estadios del fútbol profesional de nuestra liga. Cuando el portero rival va a despejar un balón, en la tribuna empieza la gente a extender los brazos y a lanzar un tenue eh, que, se, que estalla cuando el portero despeja y le gritan, puto. Es una palabra muy complicada. Es una palabra de un significado, de una connotación de diferentes niveles en países de habla hispana. Pero es una palabra que tiene una raíz negativa. Eh, las autoridades de nuestro fútbol no hicieron nada en el inicio de esta festividad, de esta parte de la fiesta, y 30 años después tienen un gran problema para tratar de erradicarla de las tribunas de los estadios. Eh, esta palabra eh, tiene, tiene una, un origen de connotación discriminatoria, tiene un significado en origen que atañe o que habla sobre la sexualidad, sobre las preferencias sexuales de una persona. Es, una, es un insulto hacia quien es homosexual. Ese es el origen de la palabra. Tiene diferentes connotaciones en distintos países de habla hispana, pero ese es el origen finalmente. Nuestras autoridades no hicieron nada, pasaron, insisto, más de 30 años. Eh, se siguió hablando en, en la tribuna. Todo esto surge porque se enfrenta en el clásico de Guadalajara, una ciudad de México, el Atlas contra el Guadalajara. Clásica rivalidad. El portero del Atlas, Osvaldo Sánchez, un portero que surgió del Atlas, regresa al estadio con la playera de Chivas. Se cambió de equipo. Y la afición del Atlas, en esta ira acumulada, inventa este grito para insultar justamente al portero que era de selección nacional también. Y ahí empieza a darse esta festividad, que insisto, 30 años después, ya está adoptada como un ritual de fiesta en la tribuna. Nuestras autoridades, nuestra federación, nuestra liga, no hizo nada en su momento para erradicar. Hasta que en 2014, la FIFA la unidad de monitoreo de racismo y discriminación de la FIFA, hace un llamado a la Federación Mexicana de Fútbol y le dice, no puede gritar tu afición esta palabra, porque tiene un origen discriminatorio. Esto lo detectan en un juego de la selección mexicana contra Brasil. La Federación Mexicana de Fútbol, en lugar de adoptar lo que le está recomendando la FIFA, decide voltearse y argumentar ante la FIFA que era parte del folclor de la grada, que era parte de la fiesta de la tribuna, que el aficionado no ocupaba la palabra con una intención discriminatoria, sino era parte de su ritual para poder vivir los partidos del fútbol mexicano. La FIFA empezó a analizar el tema mientras la afición seguía gritando esta palabra en los estadios cuando jugaba la selección mexicana. Y así pasaron diversas advertencias del máximo organismo de fútbol hacia nuestra Federación Mexicana sin que hubiera ningún castigo. La Federación se defendía asegurando que era parte de una idiosincrasia de una fiesta del mexicano, porque ustedes saben, somos una comunidad muy festiva. Nunca reparó en la parte, en el aspecto negativo, en la connotación negativa de la palabra. Pasó el tiempo hasta que hace un par de años la FIFA endurece las políticas de lucha contra el racismo y la discriminación y le advierte ahora sí a la Federación Mexicana que venía un castigo más fuerte, ya no iba a ser un castigo económico. Ahora, si se escuchaba ese grito en la tribuna, podría perder la capacidad de tener afición en sus estadios o los puntos en la eliminatoria rumbo al Mundial. Incluso perder la calificación al Mundial. Esto fue oficialmente anunciado a la Federación. Y había otro punto por debajo de la mesa, no se hizo oficial, pero que fue lo que hizo que cambiara la percepción en la Federación Mexicana. La FIFA le advirtió que si seguía el, el grito en la tribuna, este grito prohibido, 
corrí en riesgo la organización del Mundial del 2026, que como ustedes saben, se va a realizar en México, Estados Unidos y Canadá. En ese momento, nuestra federación entonces sí dijo, tenemos que erradicar este grito. Tenemos que hacer algo para que la afición ya no grite, porque vamos a perder vamos a perder la capacidad de organizar el mundial. Y como ya se dijo en otras eh, charlas antes, cuando el dinero toca la puerta, entonces se escucha. ¿no? La federación justamente dijo, tenemos que hacer algo. Lanzó una campaña feroz con figuras del fútbol mexicano para pedirle a la afición, si tú gritas, nos van a castigar a nosotros y tú vas a perder el mundial de fútbol. Ese era el sentido de la campaña. No tenía un sentido educativo. No tenía un sentido de crear conciencia de lo que significa esta palabra, de lo que atenta contra una comunidad, sino apelaba al hecho de que nos iban a quitar un mundial. Y así empezó la campaña. La pandemia que, que estamos atravesando no ha permitido ver los resultados concretos en los partidos de selección mexicana. No sabemos si esta campaña todavía fue efectiva. Lo que quiero dejar en este mensaje es nuestra federación está actuando porque va a recibir un castigo. Pero es nuestro trabajo como periodistas deportivos no solamente comunicar que va a haber un castigo, sino ayudar a educar, a concientizar a la afición de lo que significa esta palabra. Nuestro, nuestro trabajo es justamente en lo que está fallando la federación como periodistas deportivos tenemos que ayudar a educar a nuestra afición, hacer que entienda que aunque es parte de un ritual, o cuando, aunque la sociedad lo asume como parte de un ritual, tenemos que explicarle la connotación negativa de esta palabra, tenemos que explicarle que las palabras o los insultos que atentan con, contra una comunidad no pueden ser utilizados ni como parte de la festividad en un estadio. So, I will, I will speak it in English. Uh, our job as a sports journalist is to create conscience about the words that even they are part of a festivity or, or a party, they, are, they have a, uh, a discriminatory connotation. So it's our job, even if the authorities fail to create that conscience, we have a sports journalist to create conscience about discrimination. Thank you. Well, this was uh, very good. Thank you very much for that. You are right, and uh, we will try to do it as AIPS. Now we are rushing to the, to the end. I remind you, if you do have questions, send it on email, but be aware that we will be with you only until 4 o'clock. It is uh, 35 minutes more, so we are rushing to our next panelist. It is our Vice President, AIPS Vice President, Mr. Obi Mitchell. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... You are our very good Secretary General, and of course, um, my colleagues who have uh, tried to really give a good picture of uh, this conversation. I just want to start by uh, responding to my very good uh, sister, Christine, that uh, in some parts of Africa, we already have uh, a way of identifying our national teams. We give them names that uh, really carry the color of what they do, they are the, the uh, full, uh, character of what they do. In Nigeria, for instance, the women's national team is known as the Super Falcons and the men known as Super Eagles. It's about raining in uh, Abuja here. I hope uh, the connection will be very good. And to keep to your seven minutes, I would like to uh, really go with uh, my flow. I hope I won't be too fast for the translators. I just want to say that uh, this is no longer time for us to pretend and that we cannot continue to live a lie. We can't even like uh, the uh, rising tennis star who we saw in the US Open, Naomi uh, Osaka, uh, indulge in wearing masks to remind us of uh, the victims of uh, an intolerable act which has been soaked in a culture of false supremacy. Indeed, uh, the mask is off and our conscience bleeds like an open wound. Today, I want to say a very big uh, thank you to AIPS family for the courage in cheering open an overflow subject of racism and discrimination in sports. In the past, just like we have seen 
The rhetorics, the slogans, and symbols of protest have been loud, but uh, they've been pitiably episodic. But today, all around us, in the streets, in the stadia, in the stands, on the courts, along the corridors leading to the locker rooms, and right there in our hearts and conscience, racism, indeed a dirty word, stares us like a broken mirror in the sun. It is time for all of us as journalists and stakeholders to tell the truth, and only the truth can heal the open wound of our conscience. In this brief uh, intervention, I will just attempt uh, to be, not to be descriptive, we have had so many stories, or paint the pictures of the despicable shades of racism and discrimination that persists in uh, muddying the waters of our beloved spectacle sports. The examples abound, and they are not limited to the monkey cries or the allusions, the banana images in the stadium, the headlines from the newsrooms that capture the ugliness of black in fine print or the constant sexualization of talented women in sports, or the cosmetic uh, phrases of sport leaders, uh, coaches, players, and even fans who on social media often eat, hide under the cloak of uh, tokenist gestures to promote a ghost culture that should be long have been buried. I want to say that sports is highly sensitive to racism and discrimination. And those in the past and present who have dared to abuse the spirit and ethos of Olympism, which abhors hate of any kind, even innocently, have found space in disgrace. There is really no hiding place for them in God's head. You remember the story of uh, Howard Cosell, the great American sportscaster, who wrote, uh, I never played the game, and was a very good friend of uh, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Indeed, during the course of a game, he had these excited remarks of uh, that little monkey gets loose, doesn't he? That was on a black player. It almost ruined his entire broadcast reputation despite his inno innocent uh, protestation. There have been those who interestingly have used the vehicle of sports to promote justice and racial equality. And they found an abiding place and grace in the hands of a loving humanity. Of course, my uh, very good colleague, uh, Mark Lissin, talked about Nelson Mandela. And who can forget uh, that 1995 Rugby World Cup final in which he had an evergreen uh, uh, captain shirt. And it was indeed a touching reminder of what sports can do and how it can adjust a society with a century-old chronicle of racial divisions. I also don't want to forget that it's four years now that the dispensation of Gianni Infantino as FIFA president opted to scrap a tax force on racism and discrimination, which included as members, not only our good uh, Afrocentric uh, AIPS president, Gianni Melo, but also my very good uh, colleague, uh, Osazu Obaiwuna, who insists at every opportunity on the power of the global body uh, to go beyond rhetoric, symbolism, and act decisively on a cancerous issue that has sickened the game. We've had the UFA uh, uh, side of it, talking about what uh, UFA and FIFA has been doing. But uh, notably, the tax force, although they had a short stay, which was criticized by some good players like uh, Yaya Toure and Lilian Turam, they still came out with a commendable two-pronged direction on how to tackle racism. Their belief and consensus then obviously shared by some of us, remain that FIFA, as a leading global sports organization, has the cloud to do more in terms of initiating and adopting a blueprint that should carry stick sanctions for racist acts at all levels, as well as an enlightenment program that is as vigorous as what we have seen of the COVID-19 campaign. And some will even add what we have seen of uh, corruption. You saw the shuttles of the president moving from one place to other and in order to seek to change uh, ignorant attitudes and mindset of those with uh, prejudice. The time I say is running fast for FIFA to boldly show his face in this fight, even as one is encouraged by the body's uh, unyielding drive to leave the women's game and draw it close to uh, an impressionable level, which many perceive uh, the symbolic leadership of his secretariat by an African lady. I am happy that uh, the Secretary General is with us today, and uh, 
the women definitely are gingerly coming and deliberately having a voice, even not loud as it should be, at both global, continental, and national sphere of the game. But as some will argue fervently, women in sports should be appreciated and judged by their talent and performance, and definitely not by their sexuality. Hopefully, as the guardian of the beautiful game, FIFA and its leadership should strive to watch well its postures and conduct in matters that is listed uh, easily conversations on racism and discrimination. I am drawn to a petition which was being put together last week by some African journalists and soccer fashionados to protest the disregard and disdain as well as marginalization they suffered in the course of uh, a question and answer session of uh, the General Assembly press briefing by the FIFA president. From the petition, it was clear that um, this act did not go down well. And also they brought back uh, disturbing echoes of FIFA's six months uh, command and control of the 63 year old Confederation of African Football, the one we call CAF. Of course, our good uh, Secretary General and Madame was in charge of that command and control. No doubt at a time when the world is frustrated with the casualties and calamity of an unpredictable virus, I sincerely think that FIFA president, like other prominent leaders of sports and society, have a responsibility to consistently send out an unequivocal message that they won't stand for racism, discrimination, and hate on any front. That message must be embedded in a comprehensive protocol. Our concern may not be all about football. There is the issue of uh, the old 87-year-old uh, sports leader who was detained for almost uh, two years in France tried during the period of COVID-19 uh, for a case of corruption. Of course, the verdict uh, came out uh, last week, a verdict that has been appealed at. But then we have on the same scale, leaders of sports who have uh, in the last five years, even been charged with corruption, who are yet to face trial. Some will look at it and say different strokes and different folks. It all sums up. But which way do we go? Finally, let me say that um, in the wider society, it is difficult to feel the pulse of a de deliberate effort to check uh, racism. From the corporate to the government fold, one waits in vain for any concerted effort to make life thoroughly, un thoroughly uncomfortable for those with zero respect for humanity. In this 14th sphere, I will attempt two considerations. The first is from the former governor of California, and a professional bodybuilder, the Austrian-American Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, from his heart, he says, I have learned a long time ago that the only way we can really eliminate hatred is to face it head on. It is not always comfortable, of course, but stereotypes about racism, religion, gender, or anything else, they are like cancer. If you have a tumor, you wouldn't quietly hope that it slowly disappears. You will zap the stuff out of it with chemotherapy, cut it out, and try every experimental treatment until it is gone. This is no different. It is difficult time for our country, but I know if we have the courage to do something about it, to do the right thing, we'll come out stronger in the end. Of course, uh, the last reflection is from one nursed and groomed in the tradition, environment, and struggle in the fight against racism and its antecedents, slavery. Who will forget Leopold Seda Senghor, the former president of Senegal, and leader of the Negritude movement of the 60s and 70s, which find an echo today with the Black Lives Matter. Here, though, is another Senghor, the president of Senegal's Football Federation and mayor of the historic island of Goree. Augustine Senghor is his name, and in a brilliant report to a comment by Monsieur Noël Le Gray, the president of the French Football Federation, he gave us this food for thought. As embarrassing as the problem of racism in stadiums may be for the leaders that we are, we must not resort to nihilistic exorcism to remedy it. Racism in stadiums should not be trivialized or minimized either as an isolated fact, an epi phenomenon, or a necessary evil just to save this beautiful spectacle, which is poor football. The remedy by de-dramatization will be just as ineffective as a simple anesthesia has never healed an injury. That's if you are looking at the victim of the race racist or illness for the racist. I remain convinced that if we put the same energy and the same rigor in finding the solution to these facts of racism, after having accepted the existence of them as those which made it possible to create the VAR 
to track down certain gambling facts which formerly escaped the referees and match officials. Racism will not Mitchell, only be I'm thanking you for this because it you are simply way over the time. That is, that is the time. I want to thank you, uh, Jura, for I will allowing me to drop this time. I and I hope for, uh, uh, for the, during the conversation, we'll have thank plenty you, of Mitchell. time to... Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you. And uh, as you. German says, it is uh, Zucker comes to less, sweet at the end. So I will let my president to announce the final panelist. Mr. President. Yeah, first of all, I have to thank her patience. And uh, I am very glad that uh, Mrs. Fatma Samora, Secretary General of uh, FIFA, is with us. Sorry if you are late, but you know, journalists are always late. It, this is our problem. And uh, now I think that the most important thing is that uh, the floor is yours. And we are very glad to hear your voice. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, President Jari Merlo, thank you for the invitation to participate in this afternoon forum. Greetings to the other speakers who deliver such engaging addresses today. First, I would like to state that I hope everyone participating in and following this event is safe and well. And when you look back on the last few months, it's clear that racism and discrimination have come to the fore of the global news agenda like never before. Perhaps if we can take one positive away during the period of lockdown, it is that stories and occasion of racism and discrimination now reach us in real time via our increased use of social media. It was indeed during the lockdown that I read about the tragic case of George Floyd and so the shocking and harrowing video of his arrest. Each day, I read about discrimination and racism treatment of people around the world and learn about movement such as the power of using three simple words, say her name, to keep the cause for justice for the deaths of Breonna Taylor, a 26 years old emergency medical technician firmly in the spotlight. I know that as a first ever female Secretary General of FIPA, who is a black African, I have the powerful platform and a responsibility to use my voice to call for social change and greater tolerance, understanding and equality. And this is something that I have been strongly committed to throughout my life at FIFA. You will see that in the wake of George Floyd's death, I say the opportunity to highlight a simple message via my Twitter account that Black Lives Matter and that racism should be nowhere in society. FIFA President Gianni Infantino shared this belief and together we assembled a combination of 40 FIFA legends as well as current and professional footballers and asked each of them to take a picture in a simple black t-shirt with one of the following messages, stop racism, stop violence, and stop discrimination. These pictures feature players like Gianluigi Buffon from Juventus, Marcel Desai, a FIFA legend, DJ Drogba from Cote d'Ivoire, Lucy Bronze from England and Olympic Lyonnais, and Laura George, a French FIFA legend, Wendy Renard, French and Olympic Lyonnais, and Rio Ferdinand, also another FIFA legend, were there posted across their own social media platform as well as FIFA's. And I'm proud to say that we reached 44 million fans with these important messages. At FIFA, we are committed to tackling racism, unlike some would like to believe, and rooting it totally out of football, a game so beloved around the world, and often featuring teams made of players from different races and societies. Part of our blueprint for the coming years is making football truly global for our vision for 2020, 2023, which includes two fundamentally important pillar on racism and human rights. These pillars reinforce FIFA's commitment to fighting against racism and uprooting all form of discrimination from the beautiful game 
by implementing additional anti-discrimination policies along with grassroots educational programs and toolkits to support our 211 member association around the world in addressing these issues. I hope I'm not going too fast for a translator. They also underlined FIFA's commitment to respecting human rights and striving to promote their protection. FIFA will continue to embed this commitment across all of its structures and activities, including the implementation of human rights plans for its tournament and a growing engagement with confederation and member associations to protect and promote human rights in football. FIFA also created a good practice guide on diversity and anti-discrimination, which sets out a five pillar strategy focusing on education, regulation, controls and sanctions, networking and engagement and communication to support all FIFA member association in strengthening their activities to ensure a welcoming atmosphere free of discrimination. In addition, we have modernized and adapted some of our activities and measure to foster and promote anti-discrimination, such as the FIFA disciplinary code, which clearly states that racism and discrimination have no place in football and that FIFA will not hesitate to tackle any form of discriminatory behavior. Our three step procedures mentioned by George earlier, which apply to all FIFA competition Practically speaking, it means that if a discriminatory behavior occurs, the referee has the authority to first stop the match and request a public announcement asking for the discriminatory behavior to cease, to suspend the match until the behavior stop following another warning announcement. And finally, if the behavior still persists, he or she can decide to abandon the match. FIFA has urged our 211 member association to adopt these three-step approaches for the domestic competition. And we have implemented a series of in-stadium measures and communications to combat racism, including an anti-discrimination stadium message displayed before every FIFA match. And reactive anti-discrimination stadium announcement that don't interfere with the match and can be made at any time. This initiative built on a regular safety and security measure used to prevent and to react to discriminatory incidents before and during FIFA matches like pre-match scanning of fans carrying banners at the stadium gate and through the pre-match application. Direct communication and dialogue with spectators at the stadium gate and in the stadium to achieve an immediate change in behavior. Confiscation, removal of discriminatory items and expulsion of an individual or individuals from the stadium. FIFA has also implemented an anti-discrimination monitoring system to identify discriminatory behavior at FIFA's competition, including racist incident. We created a complaint mechanism for human rights defenders and hotline reporting system for unethical behavior and integrity related misconduct. Diversity and anti-discrimination training for FIFA match officials, FIFA employees, other staff such as the stewards, food and beverage staff in stadium, etc., And of course, FIFA volunteers for its competition is something that we do on a daily basis. We also created a FIFA diversity award in 2016 to recognize an outstanding organization, initiative or football personality that stand up for diversity and anti-discrimination in football at national or international level on a sustained basis. The FIFA Foundation project promotes social inclusion 
through football, including numerous grassroots initiatives through the FIFA Foundation community. Program and football for schools and the FIFA legend as ambassadors. All those initiatives are routine now in FIFA agenda. And once a year, FIFA promote diversity and anti-discrimination by dedicating a FIFA competition stage to special diversity and anti-discrimination activity. The semifinals of the FIFA Women's World Cup France 2019 were accompanied by a special pre-match protocol, including captain's video message, stadium announcement, the slogan, leaving football, leaving diversity on all stadium advertising board and all player presented a banner saying, leaving football, leaving diversity. As a black African woman in sport, I have myself encountered racism and discrimination. As FIFA president Gianni Infantino officially announced me as a FIFA new secretary general in May 2016 at the 66th FIFA Congress in Mexico City, I think that some people were skeptical and wondered what does this African this black woman know about football? Well, quite a lot of actually, not only had I been married to a former football player for 28 years at the time and had many friends among the top African players in Europe and Africa, but I was a football fan too. I also knew about the positive power of football and I had seen firsthand its ability to shift mindset, change lives, as some of you may know, prior to joining FIFA, I spent 21 years working on humanitarian projects with the United Nations in countries experiencing several crises. It was during one of my missions in the Iberia back in, 20, in 1996 that I saw how the fighting stopped for two things, brain and football. And I realized the power of the seemingly simple game to bring people together. So when the opportunity arose to take on the role of Secretary General of FIFA, I wanted along uh, the president of FIFA to improve football governance so that FIFA could once again use football as a tool to bring positivity to people's life around the world. And I wanted to test the UN values by using football as a powerful tool for long-term changes that could bring an end to racism in and discrimination. Racism and discrimination are not allowed, are not always clearly visible. And in the world of football administration, they are often shrouded by false smile. And during my 20 years as a diplomat and development actor, I have seen the worst and the best in humanity following my postings to Italy, to the Republic of Djibouti, Cameroon, Chad, Guinea Conakry, Niger, Madagascar, and Nigeria and Central West Asia. This gave me great, great perspective, which in global football and the politics that comes with it is very useful. So despite the many people who I'm sure wanted to see my mission failed, a series of reform were introduced under the leadership of Gianni Infantino. I persevered and I am proud at what we have been able to achieve in terms of diversity and also equality in FIFA over the past four years. Prior to Johnny taking on the role of FIFA president, the number of women in senior management role at FIFA was zero. Now I'm proud to say that our drive for diversity sees three extremely talented female chief officers in FIFA management board comprised of seven chief officers in total. We now have a female chief women football officer, a female chief officer of human resources and services, and a female chief officer for education and human rights. FIFA Council has six female members and there are 39 FIFA members in the committee and 16 female secretary general in the member association around the world. In terms of mem female member association president, we have, of course, Madam Aisha Johansson from Sierra Leone Football FA. 
She is joined by two strong and competent ladies, Sonia Fulford, the president of Turks and Caicos FA, and Johanna Wood, the president of the New Zealand FA. I believe that the next major shift needed in addressing discrimination and racism is connected to the perception of African football globally and by African, Africa itself. Africa is bursting with football talents and I want to see Africa at the top of world football. But in order to get there, we have to address Africa's need to shake off the racism and discriminatory stereotype. It has been saddled with about itself. And as a result of our colonial history and to believe in ourselves as African, our ability and that of African football and to aim for greatness. We as African must work together to do more, to harness African football talent and develop it. I believe that we have the shift to shift our own mindset about the potential of the African game to cast off all racist stereotypes and aim to raise football to the highest international levels in Africa. And raising standard is how I shall conclude my address today. The only way we can tackle racism and discrimination that are unfortunately still present in our society is to raise standards. It is only through raising standards of education, dialogue, and implementing more initiative like the one I mentioned previously that we have a chance of rooting it out of the world most beloved sport, football. All of you following this webinar have the power also to make a difference when it comes to racism and discrimination. Raise your own standards. Call out negative behavior when you see them happening. Explain why these behaviors are just unacceptable. Use your privilege to be an ally for those experiencing racism and discrimination. Ask them what you can do to help. In short, be woke. I believe that the more we come together and support each other, we can raise standards, change outdated opinion and belief and move together toward a brighter and more diverse future for the world and of course for sport. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Samura, but I would like to ask you two questions because uh, I was involved personally, so it, it's very interesting for me to know first, why did FIFA dissolve its task force against racism? I was part of, of, of this group. And after you said that the next major shift needed in addressing discrimination and racism is connected to the perception of African football globally. Can you explain, elaborate better this? Well, I'm, I'm very glad to answer uh, the question regarding the disbanding of the FIFA task force. This is a recurrent subject, and uh, let me tell you just a few things. The FIFA Task Force Against Racism and Discrimination existed from 2013 to 2014. And thanks to its recommendation, FIFA has been able to give a major boost in the recent years to its work on diversity and anti-discrimination in football. But let me also tell you that the Task Force on Racism and discrimination was a temporary structure with a very defined mission. Once this mission was complete and once it had made its recommendation, the structure was naturally dissolved. And FIFA is definitely aware of the fact that the fight against racism and any other form of discrimination is a long-term process, which is why the task force recommendation led to sustainable measure as outlined in my address. The FIFA Executive Committee, which is now being replaced by the FIFA Council, meeting minutes of 20 and 21st March 2013 mentioned that the task force for the first time. Therefore, the start, it starts really in March 2013. 
The task force met three times. It was before my time, of course. On May 2013, on September 2013, and on December 2014, meaning more than a year between meetings two and three. All right, Obi? The termination of the task force was made official on the 23rd of September 2016, after almost two years of no activities, including because of the ban and indictment of the task force chairperson, Jeff Webb, and the departure from the exco of the task force vice president, Mr. Jack Anuma. The task force was a personal project of the president at that time, Blatter, with a short-term aim of providing a report to the Congress of 2013 in Mauritius. It aimed at lead the action against racism in the areas of education and prevention, the catalog of sanction and accountability among all those involved in the game. This would lead to the submission of concrete proposal to the FIFA Congress 2013 to help eradicate this evil from football. It must be said that a few appointed members, I'm not sure about you, Mr. President, did never actually attend this task force meeting, but were later vocal about criticizing its disbandment. I'm sorry. The task force is, per definition, not a standing committee. It was never meant to last forever. The recommendation delivered by the task force were well intended, but in some cases, not feasible at all. And with impossible timelines, given the human and financial resources allocated to this field, the chairman of the task force was not really interested in finding practical solutions to fight discrimination. Let's face it, his agenda was a different one. He was then banned by FIFA for life and indicted in the US for a number of wrongdoings. The concrete work to fight discrimination in football need to be delivered by FIFA and not by a task force, I'm sorry. It is the same with the Human Rights Advisory Board. They recommend, but we deliver the work. Therefore, and to conclude, it's not the non-existence of the task force that is relevant, but the implementation of its recommendation and the existence of a solid, concrete, and permanent work to fight discrimination through the initiative and programs, as I have mentioned in my speech. Thank you very much. So, so, sorry. Regarding, uh, regarding the major- uh, Can I tell you only one thing? Mrs. Uh, Somora, regarding, I, I made the question, not because I want to be part of a, a new task force, because we were there, unfortunately, the, the meeting were very quick and it was very difficult to find out also also a, a conclusion. But the only thing that I have asked you, only because I have not received any letter in which somebody will tell me that it was over, because it's normal that it can be over a task force, but nobody tell officially, no? And this is a little bit strange sometimes, because some of our colleagues, they ask me why they don't call us. I think that it is a problem of FIFA, they have changed the policy and is fine. We, we don't need to be part of a task force, no, but it was only for this reason. I but think that President, sometimes I'm, it's better. I'm sorry if to, you were not personally being uh, informed, but uh, uh, I know that Osasu for sure was informed. That was the only person I knew at that time, <laughs> my arrival. And uh, I'm sorry also to say that uh, he was not present at the last meeting when the recommendation was made. So it's easy at the end to be critical. But uh, I think the position oh, but of is not a problem. Eh? In, in the vocabulary, the task force has a mission to deliver when they made the recommendation sure. that some of you did, then it was dismantled. And if it was not officially been announced to you, I'm sorry for it, but we can still correct the course of action. No, I've asked only no, be I've because asked somebody has asked to me, but uh, for me, it's fine. Okay, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. Wait, wait. Uh, uh, President, to respond very, very quickly to regarding uh, 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 what you asked me on the African football, I, I, in my view is that African football can take the spotlight on the world stage. And uh, my six months mission as a FIFA general decree for, for Africa 
helping me to really understand the issue that uh, are at stake in African football. Unfortunately, the colonialism has played a large part in the global view of our continent, uh, being uh, discriminatory and racist. Similarly, our view of ourselves as African and our potential has also been negatively shaped by the legacy of colonialism. Our continent possesses football talent that is simply amazing. And I firmly believe that we must do more to harness this talent and develop it so that African football can reach the highest of heights. I'm heartened by the commitment of many people within football around the world and indeed in Africa to provide expertise and guidance to Africa football. And I hope it will grab these opportunities and flourish so that it takes its rightful place as a world leader in identifying, developing, maximizing male and women football talents. The FIFA president and I, we share, as I said in my previous uh, address, the same opinion regarding the amazing potential of African football. And his announcement earlier this year of a plan to take African football to the highest height by focusing on refereeing, investment, mobilization and competition development fills me with great hope for the future of the African game. Okay. Th thank you very much. I, I thank you and also all our other panelists that uh, uh, were with us today, are with us still today, because unfortunately we, we went out of uh, our terms, the, the two hours, no? But there are many, we receive some question and we will ask to the people that has question to send to us that we will deliver to every panelist so they can answer directly to them as we did sometimes in the past, because it's important that we continue the discussion. I think that today was very crowded, the, the, the environment of the panelists, because we wanted to begin a discussion. We want to open the mind of the people. After we will follow with perhaps special discussion regarding special issue with before one or two panelists maximum. So after there will be the possibility to interact together. But this is the first step, is the first important step because what they told us is very important. I hope that you take note and after together, we will create the possibility to meet again and to go deep in all the problems. Because what we have seen today, Carl Eric Nielsen has spoken about how UEFA reached a point, but also as also Mrs. Samura has, after has uh, spoken, there is the problem also of inclusion. That is a, an important issue now I can tell you from Italy, because especially in Italy, we are leaving this problem of the immigrants that are coming and after how to help them to enter in the society, to spread around all Europe and to have a decent kind of life. <clears throat> so the, the matter is very important for also next occasion of discussion. And after I, I, I must thank also uh, Nicola Rizzoli that has uh, spoken about the point of view of the referee, that they are on the field and after they have to implement what are the uh, rules that uh, UEFA, FIFA and everybody is giving to them. It's not so easy to make a choice in a stadium with perhaps 60,000, 80,000 people to stop a match is a big responsibility. And we have to help them because in some moments, the fans are using the so-called racism for their purpose, that is to blackmail sometimes the club or sometimes also to work with the organization of the legal betting because stopping a match, they can stop the result. And especially in the Eastern country uh, of, of the world, in Singapore or in Hong Kong, what count for the betting, for the legal betting is the result at the moment of the stop. So there are a lot of things that, uh, we have to open our mind and to understand. After we have seen with Mark Leeson and Ron Thomas, the history of the racism that was 50, 60 years ago, where we, we, we begin to
to understand how big was the problem because what we have forgotten to say that in 76, there was the first boycott of the African nation to the Olympic Games in Montreal. The team were already there, but after they left Montreal, because the New Zealand rugby team went to play in South Africa. And after it began a, a long, long discussion again. But as Mark has told, sport has helped South Africa to come out, to come out with a new society. And step by step, I think that they will find the right, always the right way. Donna and Christine. Christine are the women for the fight. Donna is the witness of the most important moment of the world sport. And Christine is, a, is the fighter. I know her since many years that we were always around and she was, was always straight, especially about this problem. And in the moment that the problem of racism in the USA is so tough. And I must thank also Carlos Ponce that has given to us another perspective of the kind of wording that can bring to, to the racism. I think that it was very interesting because sometimes we think that uh, racism is only black and white. No, racism is more deep. It's in every country. As it's only told even in Italy sometimes, uh, when th th they stop the, the, the match uh, in, in, in Naples, in Rome, is because the people were calling the people of Naples in, in, a, in the wrong way. And this was Italy. And there was no black and white. It was another, another matter. And after Obi Mitchell, very precise in defending Africa rights. And I think that he, he, I agree with him that they have to, Africa has to defend his uh, right. But also, we must put the right in the complex of the world. Because sometimes people say that we are too much Eurocentric. Sport is too much Eurocentric. Maybe that it can give this impression. But sport is uh, working to be wider. And I think that with our intervention, with our discussion, we can help also to make a, a, a less difference between the different kind of experience. And at the end, I have to, again to thank uh, uh, Mrs. Samora to be with us because we have begin with UEFA that is, is the, the top uh, federation from Europe and the top, the top confederation after we have FIFA tomorrow we will go to speak about another very delicate matter regarding the sex problem that there are, the transgender, the situation of, of, of women that has high level of testosterone. And I think that that uh, issue is very sensitive. And I hope that you will be with us to follow the next uh, panelist because they will be very interesting. Thank you very much to everybody. Remember, send us your question that we will deliver exactly to the panelists and they will answer to you. And sorry if today we were too late, but unfortunately, when something is important, sometimes it takes more time. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye, President.